Now here's what I mentioned earlier about the Uffizi Gallery. Here's one end of that U-shaped building and here's the other end. When I was standing here I thought this was a really great way to illustrate the way linear perspective works. In fact, how you could figure out linear perspective from just observing things. And of course we benefit from having uh, cameras and photographs these days because we can take a picture like this and then we can do exactly I will, as I will do in the next slide and we'll mark lines on it following along the roof line here and the roof line here and this line here and these lines and you may be getting the drift naturally they all point to a, a certain location called the vanishing point and here's how they do it so in this case I've actually applied the lines using PowerPoint and tried to run along parallel to all of these things and you see they they all meet in a place called the vanishing point now the importance of this was that in trying to design pictures compose them to be more realistic remember they didn't have cameras they had their eyes but not cameras it was important for an artist to be able to sketch underneath the pigment to sketch on the canvas first and then to use that sketch as a guide for painting when Brunelleschi figured out how these lines recede in the distance in an orderly way by his studies of the baptistry it became possible for artists to draw these kinds of things in first. They would first pick out a horizon line, which is sometimes and quite often in the middle of the painting, and on that horizon line they would pick out a vanishing point, many times the very center of the painting. And then they would draw sketch lines like this in, so that as they sketched in buildings, here if they were drawing this they would sketch in a building on the left and on the right, and this would be a guide. All of these lines this way would be a guide to the way the roof lines in the building would recede into the distance. If you were drawing figures in the distance, you might draw a human figure here of a certain size, and that figure here would be drawn much smaller in a very organized way. This is what the Romans were attempting to do with the painting that we'll take a look at in a second, a hearkening back to the uh, time of Christ in that vicinity, where people could kind of guess at the size of things in the distance. With perspective, there was a definite mathematical way they could determine how to make it look accurate. So the sketch came first, then the painting. Exactly the opposite of what we did here in taking the picture and then drawing the lines on it. Now Brunelleschi was an architect and he was one of the key figures in bringing back Roman and Greek architectural features, but he applied them in ways that had not been done by the Greeks and the Romans. Here we see the use of Greek columns, but an entablature that is really much broader on this small chapel, really much broader here, the entablature, and cut into it with an arch, a rounded arch, the Roman arch, not a pointed Gothic arch. So we see a conscious resumption here of Greek and Roman forms, because actually people in Italy realized that Rome was a very grand place, and they wanted to recapture that. And by going back more or less to their roots, they were bringing back these architectural forms, and it was very successful. This resumption of these architectural forms has lasted to the present day. This is the inside of that small chapel, the Capella Pazzi. Here's an interesting thing. This has nothing to do with Gothic architecture. It was built shortly after the Gothic era, but it uses Greek and Roman elements, although here too in rather a false way. This is called a pilaster, this thing. It's not really a column supporting anything. It's a surface decoration. But it harks back, and here around a corner it looks even more like a column, it harks back to a Greek column. So all the decoration in here is original to Brunelleschi's thinking about ways of combining earlier architectural forms, earlier than the Gothic, and once again, the rounded arch, not the pointed arch, which is a hallmark of Gothic architecture. You can see this sort of a feature very readily downtown because DePaul's own Lewis Center has this same type of decoration. It has these kinds of pilasters decorating the outside of what is really kind of a plain brick building. So the Lewis Center has them. Observe them sometime. Now we come to Masaccio. Masaccio was an artist who worked, in this case, in the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. What you're looking at here is actually a flat wall with a fresco. This has no depth to it whatsoever. It's just a flat surface. But it amazed people when they saw it because they had the distinct impression that this was a, a big hole cut out like there was a vault going backwards here. Now what 
Masaccio pictured was uh, rather interesting as well. He did picture God. This is Jesus uh, on the cross, and this is Mary, and this is St. John the Baptist. Now, who are these figures here? Well, they happen to be the people who paid to have this art created, some elderly merchant and his wife, and it was becoming the custom to paint, have yourself painted into a painting like this. Uh, you, in fact, were not known in the Bible, and you were not known as a personage of, of any note, but by including yourself in this kind of a picture, because you could afford to have it painted, well, perhaps you became a little more famous, and in your own mind anyway, you became closely associated with these holy figures. Down here, what is all this about? Well, remember, this was an era of the plagues and rampant disease from time to time. And I think that had a very significant effect on art and thinking of the time. Death was very close. So it's rather morbid to think about a crypt here that has a skeleton lying on top of it. But it was very much a factor of life in that day and age. So the big thing about this is the way that Masaccio had figured to use perspective. He drew lines here first as a guide to how to draw this vaulted ceiling and to how to make these things here recede in the distance in the way that they would if this really existed. Some people think he might have even made a model of this and then taken a look at it and worked from that so that he could picture it as, it, obviously if he had a camera he would have taken a picture of it. But that's not what he had. He had to work from this conception of how it would look. Now here, if you did the same thing I did earlier on that photograph, here is the way it would look if you do and extended the lines like this, going down, sort of backtracking on what the artist had actually done. You then determine what the vanishing point was that he chose, and it might have actually, due to my imprecision, or it might have actually been a little bit lower in that crypt under this picture. Okay, so here's the comparison. Here we have a painting that we saw much earlier, 90 BC, a Roman painting on the wall, probably in Pompeii. We do see here things in the distance. We see animals here and animals here. However, these are kind of the same size as these. Although it looks like maybe they're getting a little bit smaller, it's really no way that the artist has of doing that in an accurate way. So it kind of is guesswork. In this case, Masaccio already had these concepts of perspective in mind, so he would sketch these first, these kinds of lines, and that's how he knew how to draw things here receding this way and to make this look much more realistic in a very formal way, a way that had that removed the guesswork because of the understanding of linear perspective. Now in the same era, we see sculpture taking on a whole new look. The idea here was to quest for realism. And in this case, it was a statue of St. George, who was the patron saint of the Armorers Guild. The guilds were like unions, and the Guild of Armorers are the ones who manufactured these kinds of weaponry, swords and shields and such. So when they commissioned a statue to decorate a church, they naturally wanted something related to their field of work, and they wanted this to be something more than just a plain look. Now, I have a little trouble with that. This does look to me a bit of a plain look, but Gombrich claims that this is somebody very intently staring in the distance. The enemy may be coming, and he's getting ready for battle, and he's not flinching. The idea here is that character is being depicted, much more than a statue being just a plain image. This is something that is intended to make you feel, to make you feel what the figure being portrayed might be feeling. So there's drama here much more so than with most of the statuary of the Middle Ages.